Toby, uh, you, you're on. Uh, you got a tough act to follow. I was going to say this is a double uh, challenge, um, <laughs> being uh, one of the last three barriers to dinner. Uh, in addition to following Reed Tuxen, can, can you get closer uh, to the microphone, please? Um, in, in addition to following Reed Tuxen, um, um, all I can say is I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. And I'm also a friend of Mark's and uh, um, <laughs> uh, and a fan of Mark's, an admirer of Mark's. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, when he called me, he told me a little bit about this group. Uh, I think I may have misnamed it on the title slide, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, most importantly, he, he told me it was a group that, in particular at this meeting, wanted to hear multiple perspectives uh, from different components of the health system uh, on medical uh, genetics and um, would appreciate me saying a few things about what public health uh, expects uh, from medicine uh, as public health moves forward using genetics uh, to accomplish public health goals and uh, the mission of public health. Um, and uh, it struck me as, as being very consistent with uh, what we in public health uh, have been using as a framework to consider the public health system. You could just as well call it the health uh, system, um, uh, which is a number of sectors that have to work together in order to make effective uh, strategies like uh, genetic genomic strategies uh, to uh, improve the population's health uh, and prevent uh, disease. Uh, these being the healthcare delivery system, governmental public health, community-based organizations, uh, employers and employees, the media, and academe, uh, ideally working together. So what Reed Tuxen said about the fact that we all need to find ways to work together uh, certainly resonates <clears throat> with uh, that framework. Um, it seems to me as if there's historically been and is increasingly uh, becoming a closer relationship between public health and medicine uh, as we each uh, find ourselves more dependent on, uh, on, each, uh, on each other for accomplishing our objectives. And genetics seems to be uh, a technology um, that especially calls for that uh, interdependent uh, relationship. Uh, we in public health can't uh, accomplish public health goals with genetics. Uh, except if medical care and the medical care system uh, applies genetics uh, in their applications. By the same token, I would submit that medical care cannot, be cannot assure itself that what it does in utilizing genetics will in fact improve the health of populations and reduce health disparities uh, without uh, the full cooperation and connection with public health. Uh, and that, I guess, is the main uh, message that I, I would like to bring to the group uh, today. Um, in terms of our own role uh, in applying genetic uh, technologies, genetic knowledge, genomic uh, knowledge, um, uh, we are uh, prone to uh, take everything we do and put it into the framework of core functions of public health that were first enunciated by the IOM Future of Public Health Report. <clears throat> back in uh, 1988, uh, uh, and that is assessment, policy, development, and assurance. So using our so-called mother science of epidemiology, uh, we carry out surveillance, we gather continuing data on the frequency, the uh, uh, prevalence, the incidence of genetic-related diseases and conditions uh, that relate to uh, genetics and genomics. Uh, and make use of them in developing our own policies. By the same token, we carry out risk assessment of populations and with family health history are starting to incorporate genetics in how we assess risk and then turn that kind of informa information over to the medical uh, care system uh, to deal with. Uh, in the case of policy development, uh, we, uh, we adopt and develop and support um, various programs such as screening programs utilizing genetic knowledge, going back to newborn screening uh, historically. Uh, we provide and, and urge the provision of both patient and provider education in genomics, uh, and we try to adopt policies that create a, uh, an interface between what we do and what the medical care system does. 
Uh, and finally, with respect to the third of our core functions, assurance, in addition to assuring the uh, access to our own programs of screening, uh, as an example, um, it is the concern of public health that the public at large has access to medical technologies uh, that have proven their efficacy. So everything that's been said today about effectiveness, comparative effectiveness, certainly resonates to our desire to make sure that access to effective technology uh, is spread among the population. Um, each of our uses of genetics, uh, uh, applying that framework of core functions, necessitates linking with the medical care system. If we are to carry, if we are to carry out epidemiologic studies on the impact of genetic conditions, genetic profiles on the health of populations, we need data from the medical care system. Uh, by the same token, if we gather information on individual risk uh, through tools such as family health history, we depend upon medical care to know what to do with that in information when a patient brings a family health history to a physician. Um, our efforts to develop policies um, and our efforts to educate the public, patients, and providers need the cooperation of the medical care system if they're to be effective. And certainly our efforts to assure access to medical care using um, genetic technologies needs the cooperation and support of medical care uh, in those uh, efforts. Um, Mark suggested that um, in um, sharing comments with you about the public health perspective, I draw upon um, several projects that we in our Center for Public Health and Community Genomics at University of Michigan, uh, projects that we've been very much involved in um, along with the Center for Disease Control's Office of Public Health Genomics and its director, uh, Muin Khoury. Uh, and uh, the first of these, which occurred three years ago, was an, uh, is an initiative that some of you were involved in called GAPNET, uh, Genetic Applications in Practice and Prevention. Uh, uh, which has been a continuing attempt that the Office of uh, Public Health Genomics has had to form and support a large network committed to accelerating and streamlining the translation of genetic research into evidence-based applications in both clinical practice and public health. Certainly, uh, almost everything that's been said in today's meeting uh, fits into that goal of GAPNET. Uh, more recently, last year, we carried out uh, an extensive stakeholder consultation uh, from the um, um, public health uh, sector, in, in the public health sector, to get people's opinions on what should be the leading priorities to advance public health genomics in the next five years. And currently, we're working with uh, the Office of Public Health Geno Genomics on a conference, uh, an invitational conference, that's going to be held uh, this September, uh, which has now been named, and I have to read it because of the recent name, New Strategies in Public Health Genomics, Actions to Save Lives Now, uh, trying to uh, uh, incentivize uh, public health departments to utilize what now has evidence uh, as public health uh, strategies that can save lives, again, necessitating the cooperation uh, um, with the medical care system, and I'll get to those, um, um, those applications uh, in a moment. Um, in assessing um, what public health professionals uh, think about the promise of genetics in public health, uh, in serving public health goals, um, we find that um, most public health professionals categorize these technologies, or if you want to look at the rapidly expanding amount of tests and screening programs, um, categorize them into three categories. Uh, there's the historic uh, use of genetics in screening uh, through newborn screening programs, um, uh, which um, every state health department uh, uh, is uh, involved in and, and, and typically um, operates. Uh, then uh, at the other end, 
uh, there's a wide horizon that we look at, a broad horizon that we look at in terms of the promise of genomics to revolutionize, as some of us speak of, public health. Uh, as increasingly we in public health, as you in medical care, uh, have available to us more and more information on individualized risk for disease. Uh, we traditionally don't deal with that individualized information. We're a population-oriented uh, enterprise. But as we are able to learn more about individual risk, what do we do about that? Uh, how do we regulate the workplace when there will now be increasing information about variation in risk to various workplace exposures? So these are the sort of broad futuristic, if you will, ways in which we look at public health uh, and, and genomics from our perspective. Uh, but then um, there are several technologies um, that we now have available uh, to us that can save lives. Um, and CDC's Office of Public Health Genomics um, is in convening this conference in the fall has, is, has identified three technologies as to which there is sufficient evidence to know we can satisfy public health goals by saving lives now. And these are uh, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, and of course that being linked with family health history utilization, uh, Lynch syndrome and the utilization of cascade testing resulting from diagnosis of colorectal cancer and Lynch syndrome, uh, and familial hypercholesterolemia uh, also uh, calling for cascade testing uh, where there has been a diagnosis of that condition. And the Office of Public Health Genomics uh, has come up with the uh, statistic that if public health is able to advance these three types of programs uh, effectively, we will save significantly more lives than are saved through all of the newborn screening programs in all the states uh, each year. Uh, so these are technologies that we feel are in front of us now. They might be considered the low-hanging fruit of public health genomics. Um, the um, um, CDC has also created this multi-tier um, way of categorizing uh, screening and testing, and you've seen this list with, uh, I think it was Ned Kalange's uh, presentation, so I'm not going to repeat it again. Uh, other than to say that it is the tier one evidence-based uh, applications that uh, CDC's office is now working on uh, with the public health community, uh, leaving tier two to inform decision-making between physicians and patients uh, based on the context, the clinical scenario, if you will, um, and the evidence to date. Uh, and public health does have a role to play in trying to assure that uh, little, if any, uh, resources are being applied to the utilization of uh, technologies, screens, tests, uh, as to which there is insufficient evidence uh, of an impact on, uh, on outcomes. The, um, so when one looks at the, uh, these low-hanging fruit, uh, what uh, many of us would like to see us concentrate on now that can save lives. Um, what are the uh, expectations from, that we have from the medical care community? Uh, I've uh, put them into four categories with the acronym PEP, uh, practice, education, uh, policy, and partnership. In terms of clinical practice, if there will be effective uh, implementation of programs that utilize family health history uh, for uh, testing of BRCA1 and 2 genetic uh, profiles, if you will, um, public health needs to be involved in encouraging the population at large uh, to have their family health histories taken, to utilize tools such as the Surgeon General's Family Health Portrait. Um, it needs the cooperation and connection with the medical care system uh, in order to assure that these family health histories are utilized appropriately by the medical care system. 
uh, and of course efforts that we are both engaged in, public health and, uh, med and the uh, medical care system, to further uh, the integration of family health history into electronic medical records uh, and, uh, and uh, connecting them in turn with decision support tools. Uh, this all needs to come together if this particular uh, technology is to save the lives uh, that it can save. Uh, by the same token, um, Lynch syndrome uh, testing, uh, utilizing cascade testing uh, in order to start with a diagnosis of Lynch syndrome and utilize that in order to identify family members who ought to be tested for Lynch syndrome with resulting medical care interventions where there is a positive test. Uh, this is the kind of technology that needs both public health in organizing these programs on a statewide basis, if you will, at the same time that it needs medical care starting with the diagnosis uh, initially, which occurs in a, in a medical setting. Now, both of those technologies happen to be the sum total of recommendations made in the Healthy People 2020 report uh, that relate to the use of genetic technologies, these two. Uh, in addition, the first of these is the one recommendation that also has been given the sort of gold standard uh, imprimatur, if you will, of the U.S. Um, Preventive uh, um, Medicine uh, Task Force. Um, the uh, third of these low-hanging fruit, uh, if you will, uh, that we uh, need public health and medicine to connect together on uh, is the, uh, in the, the um, application of cascade testing to those who are diagnosed, again, initially by the medical care community for familial hypercholesterolemia um, in connection um, with uh, with the, the, an, a, a patient-doctor relationship and to move from that diagnosis to identification of family members uh, and tests of that genetic uh, uh, profile um, among those family members. And if we can do these three kinds of connections between clinical practice and public health, we can save an awful lot of, uh, of lives each year. With respect to um, education, um, we need to work together certainly on provider education. You all knew that, know that, and many of you work on, on projects of that type. Some of you are active in NICHPEG, the, the prime organization, the lead organization to, to further genetic education among uh, health professionals, including uh, medical professionals. Um, but we have much to do together in terms of informing the public at large and patients as a subset of that uh, population on just what uh, genetics mean and how the genes within us relate to the environment outside of us. Uh, we do a poor job at this point in public health uh, in enabling the public to understand how on the one hand we can say that health disparities result from social and, and environmental factors, while at the same time um, the public reads increasingly uh, headlines and articles about genetic causes of those same diseases and how these multiple factors intersect, relate to each other, and need to be studied together uh, is a task that it seems to me we we both have uh, together. And by the same token, uh, the utilization of professionals such as genetic counselors uh, is something that we both need to uh, do a better job at. Medical professionals need to know at what point a patient needs the intervention of a genetic counselor in making these tough decisions on whether to test or not, how to share and with whom to share information resulting from those tests, uh, and by the same token, it is part of the task of public health to let the public know about the availability of genetic counseling uh, when people are troubled by these kinds of, of questions and have to make these kinds of, of decisions. In terms of policy development, um, we both need to work together, uh, both sectors, on speeding up this translation pipeline. And there are several of you 
uh, have highlighted that, uh, starting from Eric Green with his left to right uh, slide. Um, an inordinate amount of our resources is continuing to be placed at the left end of these scales. Uh, again, Muin Khoury um, uh, several years ago wrote an article uh, dividing the various, um, uh, the various stages of translation from T1 to T4 um, at the end needing the increasing amount of funding of research on what is or isn't effective. Again, something you all have been talking about. Jointly, we need to be arguing for uh, not necessarily less money for basic research, but certainly more effort being placed at that right end of that uh, continuum uh, so that we have more information used in ways that you've all been talking about today. Um, we need um, uh, policies that support the integration of genomics into medical education. Uh, we need integration of genomics, as I mentioned uh, earlier, into electronic medical records and decision support tools. Um, and we need to support public health uh, in utilizing genomic tools uh, together with the medical care system. These are some of the policy um, tasks, it seems to me, that we all have before us. And it would take all of us together, hopefully, with a slice of the public at large to get these policies adopted and to get these activities and these functions um, sufficiently funded. Um, and I cannot overemphasize another policy area that we have to work on that very little has been said uh, about at this uh, meeting so far. Uh, two of you very recently used the term health disparities in your talks, but only two of you. Um, genetics, as I teach um, my students, uh, and as many of us have written about, is a two-edged sword with respect to health disparities. Uh, it can be used in ways that simply develop increasingly high-priced technologies available to the medical haves and not available to the medical have-nots or it can be used in ways that actually help us address those diseases that are mainly responsible for health disparities. And if those tools, those interventions are applied equitably, can do an awful lot to reduce health disparities. And it seems to me that um, all of us who work in one way or another on advancing the knowledge of these technologies and the application of them have a moral responsibility to be involved in efforts, policy efforts largely, to make sure that genetics is one technology that is not going to widen for further this growing gap in health disparities uh, in the United States. Uh, finally, um, there are a variety of partnerships, happily, that have been formed, that are increasingly being formed to connect the various sectors of the healthcare system together in order to improve the population's health. Um, certainly your group and the people you have invited into your conversations, your deliberations, is an example of this kind of a partnership. Uh, the, the leadership in genetics and chronic diseases in state health departments uh, have in recent years convened groups that connect public health, medical care, um, laboratorians, epidemiologists, legal experts, maternal and child health professionals, chronic disease experts, along with public health professionals. A number of coalitions have been formed dealing with cancer and heart disease from a genetic standpoint. Uh, and many of the national professional and disease-related organizations that many of you are a part of uh, represent these kinds of partnerships. Uh, and I need to separately mention the work that's being done by the Genetic Alliance, which I'm sure you're all familiar of, um, on behalf of patients and increasingly on behalf of the public at large, spreading out information, uh, nurturing these kinds of partnerships, and providing the kind of tools that enable patients and the public at large to connect with both public health uh, and medical care. Um, so um, those are uh, a few of the comments that uh, we have drawn from 
the people in public health that we've discussed uh, genomics, and particularly public health genomics, with, and uh, be happy to uh, hear your comments uh, and entertain any questions. Thank you. Deborah. So in talking about disparities from a laboratory perspective, and I know we're looking at public health perspective, but one of the things that would be extremely useful is having um, reference genomes from different race, ethnicity groups, and I didn't hear that mentioned in the sequencing group, but it, it would be very, very helpful to have that. Um, appreciate that comment. It uh, suggests that uh, in your deliberations and in your working groups, um, um, you might consider um, among what might be con thought of as cross-cutting goals uh, how what you work on might have an impact positively or negatively on uh, dealing with health disparities, addressing health disparities in the country. And uh, that would be a, uh, a service that you'd all be providing uh, to, to, um, to the country at large. And that's a very good recommendation uh, on one specific way you could do that. I have a comment that may, may or may not be <clears throat> that may or may not be out of place, but I'll make it here because you had on one of your slides the the idea that that uh, HIV HFE screening on a public health uh, or a population mm -hmm. basis mm -hmm. was uh, was a tier three effort in the in the eMERGE network. We've we have the opportunity of looking at HFE genotype people. HF, people who have been genotyped for something else in whom we happen to acquire HFE mm -hmm. genotypes for the heck of it, because it's on a lot of the platforms. And what we have found in our own group, and I think this probably represents what goes on in other places, is that there's a small group of people who are homozygous for the common mutation who, who don't carry the diagnosis and yet who have clinical features suggestive of it, and a small group of those people are actually being treated with iron, which is totally mm -hmm. inappropriate. So. It seems to me that we're at this point where you could say, well, let's go out and prospectively screen a population. That's not cost effective. But what happens when you have the data anyway? So it relates mm -hmm. back to all the conversations that we've had all, mm -hmm. all day today. The metrics, the calculus may really change. I'm not, I'm not arguing mm -hmm. with putting it on tier three. Un right understand. Now. Obviously, um, I heard in the last conversation we need to generate some evidence. But, but it really mm -hmm. sounds like we're in a different place. Mark? I'll just and I'll just add one perspective. I think I think it really relates back to the to what I'm taking away as a key concept, which is we we need to stop thinking about this as a, as being technology focused and think about this in the context. You just defined a beautiful context of how this could be highly useful, which is um, you have a genetically screened population, you look for homozygotes, and then you look for evidence in their medical record that they're that they are either on an, uh, a disadvantageous treatment or they have clinical signs and symptoms that you can detect, and then you can apply mm -hmm. that in a group that is appropriate to mm -hmm. apply it, and and that's a clinical context utilizing a technology as opposed to a technology being deployed irrespective of a clinical context, and I think that that's where mm -hmm. the intersection between what we're doing in the mm -hmm. clinic. And then a public health perspective, which is to say, okay, if we can actually demonstrate that this has benefit in this specific circumstance mm -hmm. in three health systems, then does that raise this mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. to a priority for a public health approach as we move into the idea that more and more people will have genomes? Other Thanks comments? for that, Mark, for that response. Sorry, am I hearing other comments? Mm 